I'd like to welcome everybody to Bayless Public Library. My name is Ken Miller, uh, the director. I'd like to, to welcome Owen Neal, uh, our poet for tonight. He was born in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and currently lives in Sioux, Ontario. He is a retired teacher who is known as Canada's Wolf Poet. He's published 14 books of poetry, some of which will be available for purchase and signing tonight. He's also written short stories and fiction, including Voices in Sherwood about a young Robin Hood. Um, after his reading, there'll be an open mic. Please sign up at the back table if you want to be part of the open mic. And um, Susan has the sheet there. Um, tonight, we're filming the event for possible use on our website. By adding your name to the signing sheet, you're giving permission uh, to be for us to put you up on the website. If you would rather not, uh, let me know and I'll edit you out. But most people like to be up there. So with no further ado, I'd really like to welcome uh, our poet tonight, Owen Neal. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been a long time since I've, uh, I've been here. A uh, long, long time ago when I first came to the Sioux in 1951 to teach. And uh, we used to come across here almost every, every weekend. Uh, at that time it was a ferry that took us across. Now we got that big thing, but they call it a bridge. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, tonight I'd like to just int introduce you to just a, uh, a few of my books. Uh, I have quite a few and uh, I c couldn't possibly go through them all in uh, an hour. Uh, I want to do three. One is my uh, latest production and it's a CD in which uh, uh, <coughs> uh, we've selected 15 poems and my uh, uh, son, my second youngest son is a musician and in, in Vancouver, uh, has been all his life, and he composed music to fit each one. And I'll play a couple of examples just to give you an idea of, uh, the, of the kind of uh, process that goes through. Uh, we were just blown away when we put the two together and then listened to it. And uh, it's uh, going well. I wish I'd started this about 25 years ago, uh, but I didn't, I don't know whether we had CDs then. Uh, but it's, it's certainly an interesting way to, to get poetry out to the public because people will listen, but they won't read. Uh, and in this way, you can do all three. You can read, or you can listen, or you can do both. And some people do that, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but it's a way of, of, of elevating poetry to a level where uh, uh, modern technology uh, infuses you uh, uh, on a, on a, with, more, uh, with more potent forces than uh, just the poet's uh, voice, which was the, the normal process in the, in the, in the, in the past. Uh, I spent my, most of my teaching career uh, teaching English and uh, later on English and art. Uh, so, I, and I've been doing, I did it for about 35 years. I retired in 1984, and I've been traveling ever since and writing. I moved out to the West Coast uh, from Sioux and uh, started my writing career there, and uh, it continues on to, uh, to almost every day. And I don't have uh, the forces necessary to do it every day, but uh, uh, I want to have a little fun in my old age. <laughs> Not the poetry isn't fun. Uh, I travel uh, all the time if poetry needs you in North America to travel because stores will not take your books uh, unless you leave them on a consignment. I tried that and don't do that. Uh, it's more trouble than it's worth. Uh, and then I decided just to take up traveling and that's what I've been doing since 1984 is traveling and doing readings back and forth across Canada, down into the United States and over into the British Isles, mainly Ireland, where my folks are from. Uh, <coughs> that is the poet's uh, mecca, Ireland. Because over there, as soon as they know you're a poet, they rush you and say, you got any books, you got any books, you got any books. Uh, and uh, but I don't get that in North America. Uh, I get a poet, you mean you write poetry? I mean, this is what you do. Uh, I said, yes, this is what I do. Uh, they say, oh, 
<laughs> what you do for a living. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you really yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, I want to start off just introducing you. Pardon my back. Uh, I just completed my first novel. Uh, I've been, Robin Hood has been a kind of a hero of mine since I was a kid. And that period of history that uh, he was supposed to have lived in uh, was sort of the end, the beginning of the end of the Dark Ages. And so many interesting historical things were happening in those days with the Crusaders coming back from the Far East with all this new stuff. Because uh, the, the people in, in Europe in general were, uh, they were in a dark place for sure. Uh, when you look at the, how they dressed and uh, what they knew uh, and, and their activities were very primitive. Uh, so I tried to uh, uh, put that all together over the years, and it wasn't until recently, well, a year ago, uh, that I finally put the book out. Uh, I've had several of the chapters published separ uh, separately years ago in, in uh, magazines. Uh, for instance, uh, there is a, a Robin of Sherwood magazine uh, that comes out of Britain. And uh, I had a couple of chapters published there. But I, I went to a writer's meeting in the uh, Toronto area a few years ago, and I remember the, the, uh, the guest making the statement that uh, when you write, finish what you write, and then send it out, and then keep sending it out. And the man who told this to me, or to us, uh, had his book published after 31 submissions. He sent it out 31 times before he got it accepted and published. So that takes that takes a lot of guts. To, you know, you got to be persistent for sure. Uh, I haven't uh, been able to find a publisher, so I, I do my own. I have connections in British Columbia uh, where I get help, uh, and uh, uh, it's been invaluable over the years. So I finally produced my Voices in Sherwood. Uh, I put a wolf on the cover because I put wolves wherever I can. And that's a whole nother story. I have spent most of my life with wolves. I have uh, raised wolves, uh, packs, uh, uh, British Columbia and in Southern Ontario. And I have uh, uh, written books about them. <coughs> and uh, that's sort of why they call me the Wolf's Poet of Canada. Uh, but this is a, a basically a junior novel. It's not very long, and uh, it, it's just an exciting uh, story, an eight-day uh, story of adventure with Robin traveling with his, uh, his father and other men around Sherwood Forest. Uh, and the reason for that is to, they're busy putting out the word that the Archbishop of Canterbury had been murdered in Canterbury Cathedral and uh, his father and some other men were designated to go around and let all the uh, churches and, and, and uh, prelates and the uh, knights of the realm know that this has happened because they have to elect a new uh, uh, archbishop. And uh, so this is what that story is about. Robin, when he's 13 years old, traveling around, well, at 13 then he became a man, uh, traveling and uh, having all kinds of adventures in and about the uh, Sherwood Forest. So if you're interested in that, it's, uh, it's uh, going very well. Schools are, are uh, collecting them uh, up for their libraries uh, because of the uh, uh, upgrading of uh, reading possibilities in schools nowadays. And, uh, but uh, adults have read it and have commented very kindly about how they've enjoyed the, uh, but you, it's like, uh, it's like watching a movie, uh, which brings me, I remember this is another piece of advice I got from a writer who said, that's a good idea about writing a book. If you want to write a book, just pretend you're looking at a movie and write the way you want that, that movie to go, you know, the way they, how they start off in movies and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm, uh, I only have printed 250 copies of this because uh, I want to make some additions uh, to the next printing. Uh, and, but uh, uh, the only, co only negative comment I got was from a nine-year-old girl who said the only problem she had was that there were no pictures. 
Oh. I said, well, okay, I'll fix that next time. Meanwhile, look at the cover. Okay. Uh, and uh, enjoy that. Uh, I'll just go through all this whole thing, and at the end you can ask some questions if you like. Okay. So that's, that's all the promotion I'm going to do on, on Robin Hood. Next I want to introduce you to my CD. Uh, as I say, my son and I uh, worked on this, and I'm going out to Vancouver, hopefully, this summer to do one more, because everybody who has bought this, and it's the only unit that I've been able to sell where people have bought one, and, and the next day or, so, or soon said, I'd like four more copies, or two more copies. I want to give them to my friends. Uh, one lady commented that every time she plays it, she cries, which made me feel really good, because uh, there's enough emotional combination of music and words to produce emotional uh, uh, feedback. Uh, so I'm going to play a couple of this, uh, samples for you, just to give you an idea of what it's like. And uh, uh, would you do that part for me? Uh, this is my daughter. Bart. I get it right. <laughs> yeah, this is my daughter Bart. She's a wonderful lady. I am the heart of the Taranew. When green rains came and blessed the magic trees, and we who carefree walked their talking shadows, knew songs of sadness before the Tuatha came and strung their voices to another age. I am the harp that Tara knew, all music, even as the blackbird sang. And Osium returned after hundreds of years to find old age and the shadow of the cross closing out his time of heroes. I am the harp that Tara knew, and hives changed to mead, and hogs to supper, and bards reminded all their world was real, that night was cold, and wild storms wailed, and wolves recalled the rise of morn. I am the harp that Tara knew, the pendulum of crops and war, but not the clatter of a single town. Here kings and cattle blended to their bark green and daring meant the hand's red stain. I am the heart that Terra knew when kings lived under heaven's royal roof, mantle tradition for Aaron's softer climb. Tribe willed only when a nature saw, and loyalty to death his followers' joy. I am the heart that Terra knew, the gale's true voice that loved a hero's crown, and many wore it by sword and endless song. Happy to be sad was fair legacy in the mystic island across a mystic sea. Just pause for a second here. That I have a sort of a habit of opening my books with uh, kind of the Celtic reference. Uh, Tara, of course, as you know, was the seat of the High Kings of Ireland for about 500 years, way back. And the name, the neo name, I was going to wear on my shirt, but I said, no, not cool it. Um, <laughs> the, the name, no, no neo, of course, goes back uh, over over 2,000 years, apparently, from what I've got. I called it up on the computer one day, and I got 24 pages of history about the O'Neill family. Um, the, it's called Circles on the Sand. Uh, it's a kind of a childish reference, I guess, to when we used to go to the beach and draw big circles in the sand and fool around in the, in the circle and out of the circle. It's kind of a it's a kind of a magic thing in a child's mind, maybe in an adult too, depending on how far they've grown from childhood. Uh, so, so I, we thought that was kind of a uh, a neat thing for the, the, a variety of, the, of poetry that we're going to have uh, and. Uh, the, the, the scene on the front is the sleeping giant up in Thunder Bay, uh, uh, in case you're interested. Uh, the second uh, poem in here is uh, called Jazz Blues. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, the book itself has a, a variety, so we could get not only samples of my work, but also uh, a variety of musical uh, backgrounds, so you would there's no uh, uh, problem with getting b bored with the music. So this is called jazz blues. So naturally, it's going to be a little bit of 
jazz music in the background of it. it should be self-explanatory. Old words, old songs, old jazz chords rolling cool and mellow, lighting up new torches for singers like me. Old feelings like fires, hot fingers up and down my spine, jazz licks heaping on coals for singers like me. Old hearts, sad songs, blues, smoky sax can jazz them, deep-throated notes cut rough for singers like me. Old love gone sour, salt eyes search to play the keys, and jazz is the only truth for singers like me. Old words, old songs, old jazz chords killing and mellow, lighting up old torches for singers like me. play one more of that just to give you the supreme stretch of, uh, of what was my Ithaca, number 14. 14. Mm -hmm. My Ithaca. That's another favorite theme of and mine. And where is my Ithaca? Once it was clear vision and youth, with all its strength of fist and boundless faith, Truth simple that what we seek we always find. But our quest for enduring haven takes more than innocence, that godly promise for a child at prayer. It tasks us until our wounds are deep and weariness makes prevailing hard against these ever beckoning seas that always turn in time so contrary. Yes, where is my Ithaca? I am Ulysses, yearning for the port of home at least to rest a while and ponder where I've been and sort so many strangers who came and went among these isles for sweet adventures swept all wonder. Where is my Ithaca? My soul is a dancer with nympholeptic clouds. I settle for love when the moon is goddess round. The sky is my playground of choice while earth plays its serious game of limitations. We know the rules. One part of us is bound by the beat. The other is of the ages, past and future, with equal virtuosity. And somewhere in between lies Ithaca. And where it lies, I shall eventually know, because your eyes will make it so. Ithaca will be my amber isle, set in silver moons around its sighing shores. This willful goal has eternity's voice and needs to hear your name with mine, discovery bound, in love, here in my Ithaca. Thanks, Thanks And that whole particular poem won a $50 first prize in the poetry contest mm. not too long ago. Uh, so that, that gives you uh, a sampling of uh, what you'll find in uh, the <coughs> CD and, and the book. Uh, they both go together, of course. And uh, if you're interested uh, in pursuing it, they're, they're there. So you get, you get a pretty fair idea, I think, now of what it's about. It's, uh, uh, as I say, uh, uh, I, I never get tired. It's my own, but I never get tired. Especially in the car, you can plug it in and it's close. Uh, I think it works better in a, in a smaller space where, where you can hear all the clicks and things of your of the voice. Uh, you can't. It's hard to hear in a room like this that absorbs all the sound. Are there any questions so far? Okay. I didn't have to say with your jazz when I was thinking of Ken Nordine when I was listening to that. What's that? I was thinking of Ken Nordine when I was listening to your jazz one. Oh yeah? Yes? Well, this is, this is the beauty of, of, of good poetry uh, of, of any kind. Uh, it may be, it's usually personal uh, from the point of view of the, of the author. Uh, but the thing is, 
to make it universally applicable so people when people hear it it can apply to their own special experiences and this is the the, uh, the essence I think of just about any writing but especially especially poetry uh, to say I write from personal experience usually uh, and, and I'm going to read read from total personal experience here uh, and uh, I, I get the feedback I get, which is very encouraging always, is that uh, th this is how I, I take your poem, and uh, they, they can relate it to their own experience somehow. It's, it's kind of got a kind of a universality to it, and this is what good poetry is about. It's, uh, you know, it, this is why it has such an appeal to certain people because it, it fits somehow with their own experience or emotions and they can relate to it. And that seems to bring some kind of pleasure uh, uh, to the people. The third unit is called The Eye of the Wolf. It's my, my recent, most recent book of poetry. Uh, the wolf, of course, is on the front. And, and underneath that wolf is the sleeping giant uh, that sits out in front of Thunder Bay. Uh, the uh, the idea is that uh, at the uh, foot of the sleeping giant, so the story goes among the uh, uh, First Nation people that live there, uh, is the nest of the Thunderbird. And uh, when I was growing up there, uh, we used to sit on the front porch and watch. The, we could see the lake. And we used to watch the lightning and listen to the thunder. Mm -hmm. There seemed to be a lot of, a lot of thunderstorm back in those days, as I recall. Uh, but we were impressed I, as white people. Uh, but the uh, legends that uh, went with the, the sleeping giant because of the, uh, the First Nation people who lived around there, and I got to know a number of them quite well, uh, uh, was that there was. The, the giant, when you look out on the, at the lake, you see this sleeping figure, and it looks like a real person lying in the water. Uh, and then, of course, you hear thunder, and you see lightning, and it's not, very, doesn't, not, not a very big step to, to take that uh, imaginary step into the, the other world where there is an actual thunderbird, a bird which makes thunder when it speaks. Uh, if you if you remember the map and the, there's a description about that in the book here if you look at a map of lake superior you will see that it sort of looks like the head of a wolf the way it's shaped it goes down and the mouth at the end where duluth is and then you go along the base and then the neck and goes down into the other lakes so you have uh, an actual visual thing which is a lot of most white people just can't or won't uh, make that that step and say, oh yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I take that step always. I always have in my life. Uh, and the wolf, of course, has always been my, my study. I've studied the wolf all my life. I've raised wolf packs out in British Columbia and in Southern Ontario. And I even had a wolf I used to take around the schools until we had to put him down recently because it was, it, it was old. And, uh, I really miss him. His name was Dakota. So this book is about growing up in Port Arthur, now of course called Count Thunder Bay, as Port Arthur was united with Fort William and became Thunder Bay. Uh, there's an interesting story there. I keep that keep that burging from stop here, but that's okay. Uh, what, uh, back in the 60s, I think it was, or they had a vote in Thunder, in what's now Thunder Bay, uh, what to call the Twin Cities when they uh, amalgamated. And there were three choices. There was Thunder Bay, Lakehead, the Lakehead. So the, the story goes is that, of course, that someone wanted Thunder Bay, so they split the vote and the other two, uh, and, uh, and were successful in getting Thunder Bay, which is which is still a good name. 
I, I don't mind it. Uh, so this is the, the poems I'm going to read to you now are, uh, as long as my voice holds up. I even start, I start every book with a wolf poem. Uh, uh, the, the word, the title, Eye of the Wolf, uh, I have to have a, a, a secret smile that goes with it because a number of years ago, the writers in Thunder Bay were putting an anthology together and I wanted to be part of it. And they said, oh sure, write something. So I wrote this poem called Eye of the Wolf. Uh, well, they were going to uh, uh, call the anthology The Wolf's Eye. It was my idea, but they, mm -hmm. they dismissed me and called it The Wolf's Eye. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, 20 years later, or whatever it is, I, I decided to get my revenge and title my book Eye of the Wolf. <laughs> Uh, as I was, oh, was going to say before, if you see the shape of Lake Superior, uh, Isle Royal sticks out in the Lake Superior right where the wolf's eye, if it were a wolf picture, would be. So you're, the wolf's, Isle Royal is the wolf's eye looking at all of us in Thunder Bay. Wow. Uh, okay. Number one. Well, this, uh, this is called this land of myth. This is a land of myth. Creatures large and restless roam. Shadows in the night, late re lake reflections during the day. And in their wake, smaller ones, hunting, following, seeking to survive. Kill, be killed, scavenge, graze, race, leap, dive, climb, fly, root to each a method honed by centuries. It is the way. We seek to follow, to understand. We invent where logic fails and mythology becomes legacy. That is our spiteful way. It is sourceful for our literacy when acceptance becomes conceptual and, and we live in our imagination, suspending reality for the fun of it and shipping out on a foreign sea to bear the children of another level. Thunderbird flies today. We point to his nest and think to see his progeny in each lightning strike deep in the darkness of heavy northern skies. A giant hears but stirs not in his sleep. He awaits another time. We know not when. Wolves howl closer than they are. They are forecasters of all our thoughts, fearsome thoughts, as we think fit. Beaver slaps his tail, and we are forewarned, and hawks crack the night sky with cries that shape the moon. Bears hug trees and test humanity. Forbearance is not our quality yet. We are breakers of circles. We live in spite. We will not be forewarned. We will pay, but not today. This is a land of myths, and we are its greatest. Mm. And under it is a picture of wolves. Uh, I find that uh, uh, if you put a wolf picture or with the word wolf on anything, mm -hmm. people are drawn to it immediately. And trying to find out what, what's, what's this thing about the wolf. So it seems like everybody's got this thing inside about wolves, positive or negative, but something is always there. My grandfather came over to Canada from Ireland with his oldest son uh, on, on the way to Australia. This is back in Oh, in the teens, 19, 19, 1920. Uh, it seemed like a lot of people from the British Isles, particularly Ireland, wanted to go to Australia. They'd heard about it. But the story goes, and God knows there are stories that uh, are uh, by, the, by the thousands in Ireland about everything. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, the story goes, I was told, that. Uh, Grandpa and Uncle John uh, had come across the ocean and it took a long time to go across the ocean in those days. 
and they got on the train and we're going across Canada and then we're going to sail across Pacific to Australia. But they got this far, the far at Port Arthur, and they didn't realize, of course, how big the world was, so they decided, uh, this is, we've had enough, let's just stay here. Uh, that's what we're told anyway, as children. And they bought a house uh, to live in uh, at a place called 419 Ambrose Street. And this is a, uh, a story about 419, I just call it 419. Uh, that house became the headquarters for all the others. There were, uh, I had 10 aunts and uncles in my dad's family, 10, uh, who all eventually came to Canada, either with or without their wives, and set up home in Port Arthur. So I grew up in a tribe. Uh, they were Irish Catholics. So they had yeah, four or five, six kids. Uh, my mother was a Protestant, and so we only had two, <laughs> unfortunately. I wish I had more. But uh, that's the way it was even then. Uh, my mother was, for a while, uh, out, an outcast among that group of people, uh, but not for long. Uh, and I can remember one of my aunts in particular chastising my father constantly as we grew up uh, for uh, leaving the faith of his fathers. Uh, they were very heavy duty in their church in those days. But we got along fine. My generation grew up together, all 40 or 50 of us, uh, and we made a, a, a pledge that we would not be like our parents. We'd be a lot more receptive to uh, philosophies and so on. Okay, so this is the story of 419. Uh, it's changed since the 30s, but the base is still there behind the new porch and the taste to spare painted bricks. The old last fence all covered in vines has gone between the houses and other old signs like backyards clotheslines and the old cement walk and the shingled old veranda where, shavers, where neighbors gather to talk. It's hard to imagine 419's fine role as headquarters for immigrants in their long Irish stroll. They came by their number, this family of 10, till each one was settled beyond grandpa's stern skin. He was a tough bird, that man. Two in the country to grow family food. I had two uncles at farms. And the others, Port Arthur, to make life what they could. They gathered, sister, brother, for joy or need. Each helped out the other, as was their Catholic creed. Whether dancing or at music, they shared like a feast. And then for years, as we grew up, their relationships slowly decreased. We parted to find new lives elsewhere and changed states of mind beyond the immigrant sphere. There'd been clashes, it's true, as a large family plays, but our generation sought softer ways. Our schooling was peaceful, ambition was strong. We forgot the faith's old torment, thought the old ways wrong. We celebrated together cousins, happier choices, and persuaded our parents in new Canadian voices. Some at least understood our inspiration. This fresh land gave us a new education. The war came and went and spared our lives. We went to glad futures as husbands and wives. The land of our fathers lay alive in a past one day we'd discover in an emotional blast. Things would come together in our aging feet, happy to imbibe our ancestral beat. Go, seek and find, if it mattered at all, those roots that gave us su supple ancestor call. For some it was lost, their lives rolled at peace, but others were captured and needed release. A few flew the ocean, 
to old Eris shore and called up relations who showed by the score. Hmm. Indeed, warm welcome I waited on every front stoop, from north to south round the whole Irish loop. Lost sons and daughters returning home is how they all saw us, off in Canada to roam, and they still do. When they say hurry home, hurry back home, they mean home to Ireland. In love with sweet music in their hectic past, we feel Celtic dreaming and their strange history cast. Green mists full of magic everywhere we behold. Heroes and fair ladies in bar rooms and cafes, by firesides warming, truth stretched to the limit, new martyrs forming. And beyond our fine senses, old family connection, values across oceans, innocent rejection. I review my own story, gently weigh my position. 419 sits dreaming of what once was a mission. Where are they all now? Those immigrants find choices? We know where we are, balancing new with those old voices. I've been over, as I mentioned, that to Ireland a number of times, and uh, mm. it's amazing, absolutely amazing country. It's a, it's a heaven for, for poetry, I tell you. Mm. One thing, I, I even thought about going to live there, but uh, I've got too many family connections here. <coughs> Any questions? So far? No? Beautiful. It was strange, but I, where, where we lived in Port Arthur was close to a, a river that was eventually dammed and it became a lake, Boulevard Lake. And uh, it seemed that the crows had a bigger part of our lives than they did elsewhere. Uh, I know. My mother had a pair that uh, hung around her place for about 35 years. And every, each year they would bring their little chicks uh, to her to look at. And she could go out and put food on the grass and stand there and watch them come and feed. But nobody else could do that. They knew who she was. Uh, amazing, amazing. And it was the same pair of crows that, that lived just across the street at a big tree there and for, uh, for you know, I think it was 35 years that they, they hung around. Because crows lived a long time, up to 40, 40 years apparently. <clears throat> but I used to walk around this lake on occasion for, uh, for fun and uh, uh, not always, but usually I was followed by a crow. I, it wasn't the same one, he never identified himself. But <clears throat> as I walked, he would fly <coughs> down the road and sit in a tree and wait till I came to the tree. And sometimes I would look at him, sometimes I wouldn't. And I would continue on and he would fly and wait for me to come up to another one. And he did this all the way around the lake. And when I came back to where I, I was going away from the lake, I lost him. Yeah. He just. I don't know what he, uh, uh, I wish I had the, some kind of a sense to figure out what it was about, but I don't, I never knew what it was about, but that, and it, that, it certainly wasn't the same one, I don't think. Mm -hmm. My father played the, the violin as a child, and then it became the fiddle when he grew up. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you all know what I'm saying, what I mean. Uh, my two, I had two uncles who had farms outside of Port Arthur. And those farms became the food source for most of the families who gathered there often uh, to work and to play. And in, on one of the yards, there was a platform that looked like a boxing ring, but there was actually a place where you say square danced. And the, one of the corners, of the, all the men in the family played musical instruments uh, fiddles, or violin fiddles, uh, and spoons, and uh, accordions. Mm. Uh, 
Uh, so they would play away until it got dark and then they would throw the kids into the car, backseat of the car and throw a blanket over them and carry on. And that was my first, uh, uh, the first time I ever heard about wolves because as we drove home, occasionally we saw these wolves crossing a road or the shadows of wolves. Um, because wolves, as you know or may not know, are night animals. Uh, sometimes they're out in the day, but usually they hunt and disperse at night. If you see an animal looks like a wolf during the daytime, the chances are it's a coyote. <coughs> this is called Father's Fiddle. When Father played his fiddle, sure the present slipped easily astray, as his boyish fingers found their cure and the long ago lad had his way. A long ago mother was smiling again at her favorite son with his bow. And we can imagine their sad Irish yen for that old home by the sea, don't you know? Classics father knew, but the fiddle by far was dear to his heart like the rest as they tapped their feet to an old Irish bar that reminded them all of life's best. They were poor but at peace for their orange and green. Grandma was Protestant, hence orange. Grandpa was Catholic therefore green. And they worked hard to keep all together. Seven to raise in that long ago scene before came political weather. Grandpa transgressed in the fishing trade and was outlawed across the sea. Eventually exchanged the sea for a glade in Scotland's mining country. And there the fiddle and father grew together, they say, as three younger children were added. They joined in his musical way and kept hard life lightly padded. The war came and went, mother passed on, and eleven sailed west to forget. All settled together in a new life dawn. Ah, oh, we can hear that old fiddle even yet. That long ago fiddle grew silent with time. As mankind's harder weight climbed father's shoulder, and the joy in his hands lost its lilt and its rhyme and his blue-eyed outlook turned older. No longer he sang as the world shut him out, his eyes played the tricks of old age, and that long ago fiddle when life had no doubt, grew old too in his leathery cage. Yes, that long ago lad and his magical bow are silent and gone from our sight, but memory's songs sing soft and low when I see and I hear father's light. The fiddler's joy and those dancing feet still ring when I stop to listen. And long ago thoughts repeat, repeat, while my tears make sweet memories glisten. Very good. Did you, do you use uh, poetic forms when you're writing? I mean, in other words, I, I regret to say that I can't tell a sonnet when I'm hearing it. Um, I would, but uh, you know, it, are you using forms? Or are you using? Uh, yes, I use. Um, I use all all kinds of the traditional and, and, and modern. Sometimes they're mixed up a little bit. Uh, <coughs> uh, I had a review from a place down in southern states once. Uh, uh, somebody told me they saw it somewhere in a book, and one of the comments was that, it, and he even uses rhyme. Uh -huh. uh, which tells something, I'm not sure what. Uh, but uh, no, I, I, uh, I'm fairly traditional. Uh, some, sometimes I invent some really complicated uh, patterns of rhyming, like A, B, C, D, D, back to A again kind of thing. There's all kinds of uh, ways of doing it, but not, I don't use rhyme all the time. Uh, Rhyme is certainly part of poetry because poetry is music, mm -hmm. or musical. And in, in the early days when uh, the poets traveled uh, around their world, uh, they often carried a, mu a, 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 a musical instrument with them. Uh, well, it wouldn't be a guitar, it would be a harp, a harp sometimes, or a, another instrument with strings on it. Uh, and sometimes uh, the poetry back in those days was just uh, uh, recited. Uh, 
almost born English. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting on here, so I got to skip a bit. This, 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 this one I'm going to read is it. called Boy and Raven. Raven. I had uh, quite a relationship with ravens when I was a kid. Well, I still do, but uh, people think I'm nuts. <laughs> This is called Weeds in the Lawn. My lawn has gone shaggy with flowers, mainly yellow, candles to the day, but snuffed each night to save their wicks, and then blaze again next morning, tall on spiny spindles, reaching out of tough green sword bases. Weeds, the neighbors complain, but not to me out loud. I love those wild yellow splashes that dance whenever the wind is up and give me crowded pleasures each time I pass and shrug about how long the grass is getting. Some other time when yellow fades and my weeds are satisfied, they've entertained me long enough, I'll cut their gone to seed heads off and subtly sow them for another year. The lawn will be its own green desert again. The, neighbors, the neighborhood will smile and so will I cherishing those yellow beauties that my neighbors missed. <laughs> if you notice, my name on my books have a, a dandelion seed oh, in, be yeah. in between them. I, I use that as one of my little symbols. <laughs> uh, old for new. This is, uh, th actually this happened in, uh, in uh, Vancouver, but uh, it doesn't matter where it happens. A hundred year old tree came down today. Its branches chipped in a roaring grinding machine. Its trunk in merchantable logs chainsawed. And now an empty space full of searing sun making room for addition to some human expansion. Such is the city way, this calculation to magnify ourselves in comfortable containment and sentiment is such a trite commentary with, oh, there's lots more where they came from, on ready tongues. And we nod as the chipper is towed to another concession. Yes, a hundred-year-old tree came down today, a piece of history cast aside with our civic eye. A few will mourn for a brief human moment, then hammer away with new lumber from a nearby mill never relating to just what, what went out of the yard. Yeah, you took a tree out and we brought it back again and that's lumber. Yeah, it's just one of those sentiments for the poet's share kind of thing. Uh, I wrote a poem called What I Don't Have. And I read it to a group of poets once and they said, well, why don't you write about what you do have? Mm -hmm. So I did. <clears throat> There's a whole bunch of stuff about, you know, how you, you dream about a log cabin by a, a mountain lake, wildlife all around and fish jumping, some sunsets and moonsets. Yeah. One of my favorite songs is uh, called uh, I Want to Know What Love Is. Anybody know the, the group? You yes. know Foreigner? Yeah. Group called Foreigner? Yes. Oh. Yeah, it's one of my favorite groups. Uh, I have a whole bunch of favorites. <coughs> I Want to Know What Love Is, sung in the senses of seekers, nude to the world of feeling, fresh spices on the rack, Taste buds rising in desire once announced from the leaf. Boy meets girl lyrics fashioned in bright lights, powered by voltage beat and steel string electrics. Yet always the question burns. All need to know the cure. What is this thing called love? You know that song? What is this thing called love? No. No? Okay. Yes. <laughs> oh, wait, yes. 
And then, oh, the next, yes. and, then, and then a space, and then the line, I want to know what love is. Uh, when the lights fade to lower walt, wattage, and reality fits our formula, old songs are soft reminders, good new innocence, tasting this and gulping that, and all those fresh new questions, some now partly answered. Essentials have many doors, open in no special order as ordinary life evolves. And yet there are special times for pause and wonder. What is this thing called love? Yes, I want to know what love is. Yeah. Don't we all? <laughs> when we grew, when my parents came to Port Arthur, the uh, the lakeside was all docks and uh, storage places, warehouses and uh, stuff like that, railroads uh, going by. And uh, uh, I remember my dad worked for a company that had one warehouse that went away out on, onto the lake and was set on piling, say, right out over the water. And they, the company stored all their stuff in there, supplies. Um, but that over the years, that all changed, and the, the lakefront of Thunder Bay now is a, a park with uh, all kinds of facilities for ship, shipping or uh, sailboats to come and dock in and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did a poem about that, and I, I called it "It's a Marina Now," and it just goes through that particular history. I'm rushing along here because we're getting getting on. And in that same marine park, every summer they have uh, music. All summer long, bands come and play mm. there. Yeah. It was good to hear the old boys' band pumping 40s over the park. As we old timers in our canvas chairs leaned into memories long after dark. Ah, the songs we danced to in high school gyms roared with new pleasures we'd almost forgot as the big band era paced up the heart and our feet picked out each beat on the spot. There were the lots of us there on the marina lawn, remembering our teens as we looked around, strangers sharing memories, fingers snapping and strains of that good old Glenn Miller sound. Mm. Elmer's tune and the string of pearls got some brave souls up upon their feet, and we others that sat tight and clapped our hands thinking crazy old phrases like, man, that's all reap. On and on, the old songs rolled out across the park on the harbor breeze. In childish rapture, we began to shout, don't stop now, more of the same if you please. The band played on past its allotted time. Old timers outdid the rest by far, until prim decency had its old fashioned way and let other music touched the younger folks' star. All we could talk about, as we, it's all we could talk about as we made our way to grab a late coffee, Twilight's usual play. The moment was young to judge from our faces, as light from our past gave us young lovers' graces. Yeah. Thunder Bay, or Port Arthur anyway, was, is laced with back lanes amazing places. Uh, Vancouver has them too, I noticed when I went up there. So. <clears throat> lanes, back lanes between, you got the streets, the houses, a lane, another houses on this other street. <clears throat> Main streets are specific, once marked with a name, swept and washed in our seasonal game of rush hour, crowding when then vacant by night, business as usual when the ads are just right. But back lanes are different, informally clad, paved or unpaved, often unsightly mad, with careless, careless, pardon me, with careless disposals, all colors and shapes, and leftover materials awaiting escapes. Sometimes we wonder what's behind all those fences when garbage and throwaways boggle the senses old tires or toys, old lumber, used boxes. We sniff to discover like sneaky wild foxes. 
the backs of garages, all weathered and shabby, are joined by patched fences to keep, out, keep in old Tabby. Or perhaps a new dog, and young children, of course, playing together on a teetery toy horse. Oh, there's weeds and grass growing wild alongside, and just room enough for the garbage trucks glide. It's a place for young roamers to find stuff to do, or walking the dog when the main streets a stew. Sometimes there's treasure in the mind of a boy, something to fix up with a young pirate's joy, or just stuff that's neat for the treehouse wall, a moment's excitement to share with us all. Main streets are fine for life's usual flow, where everyone knows what they'll find as they go. But back lanes have mysteries that change by the day, and young boys like me prefer that wilder way. Mm. Bring back any memories? Yeah. Yeah. Grain elevators. Oh my, we got grain elevators. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are, are abandoned. I'm just sitting there now. Mm. Uh, I wrote this when I was 77, I guess. A long time ago. And uh, Okay, pension card. Some of you will relate. I have it now. Plastic, wallet size, dark of landscape. Why not light? And gold numbered, that old nine digit familiar. My second last documental plateau in this society that bathes us in stats and puts a number to a name and then secrets it secretes it in a capital vault for final reference to be marked defunct uh, an item on a lawyer's agenda. It comes by regular mail. One stamp, nothing special. No grateful government flunky invites you to tea and tells the world how valuable you've been in building this great country and now you've come to your reward, your pension. What's the good of another card, you say? It can't get credit in a store or money from a bank machine. Customers never ask for it to know your dignity when searching through your pockets. It's no better than your SI card, already twice as old as your oldest child. And yet, there is reprieve. I hear it doubles with your car ownership to pass you free through national parks and sites of historical interest, uh, which I do all the time, of course, <laughs> or travel cheap on a railway line or perhaps the summer canal, or cooperate in a foreign land to further whet your expertise if you're not too tired. And reductions galore for government things. Just flash the card when passing through the capital. Yeah, every time. Otherwise, it's coffee free at the Golden Arches. <laughs> and perhaps at other donut places. But even there, they know you're old enough somehow and say, okay, before the card saves faces. Ah, uh, I carry it with me all the while anyway. The thought that someday it might need me. Someday I might have to prove my years when someone can't believe I'm really that old. <laughs> and that idea I really like. <laughs> and it ends toast to some friends. Here's to all who have become my friends and gave more luster to my choices. Here's to the men who shook hands simply and shared our easy manhood voices. Here's to the ladies, ah, so gentle, who gave us men our space to grow and wisely read our brazen difference with patience only saints can know. Here's to children running free who came to hear an old wolf song and paused a while to see a vision of life where someday they'll belong. And here's to the few who missed my play. May they find their treasure and lose their fears. Heartbreak steals us in the warrior's way. Time's precious waste isn't paid with tears. 
And here's to the love that's kept here pure, even though the form may go. Our greatest gift, so simply given, will touch our dreams and make us grow. So here's to all who became my friends and gave luster to my every song. But I am called by faraway voices. Goodbye for now. See you all before long. Mm -hmm.